Hey YouTube, uh, bear with me as I play with my new camera and, and some of the effects. Uh, hope it doesn't bother you too much, but I love my gizmos. Um, the other day I received a note from a new subscriber, Sodomy Hussein, about some videos uh, debunking the concept of karma. I was asked to take a look at them and if possible, create a video response. The videos are by a guy named Greg Solomon, and in his own words, he attempts to use logic and empiricism to debunk the concept of karma. I've watched the videos, three in all, and I'd like to take a moment to respond. Mr. Solomon fails in a number of respects. Um, first, he claims that people simply choose to believe in karma. But ask yourself, can you choose to believe something? I cannot choose to believe that I can walk on water. I can't choose to believe that I can fly. Belief is not something that we can choose at all. Take Santa Claus, for instance. As kids, none of us chose to believe in him. We were convinced by our parents that this fantasy was true. We did not choose to believe it. Um, so, that aside. Second, <clears throat> Mr. Solomon makes much to do with the idea that karma is intangible. It's something we can't perceive. But we've all observed karma on a simple sensory level. Um, go in tomorrow to work and act like a jerk. Call everyone names and do whatever you like. See if you don't per perceive a response. On an elementary level, we've all seen karma play out in our lives and most of us try to act in skillful ways to avoid bad karma. It's really not much different than gravity in this respect. Yes, it's easy to see the apple fall from the tree, but it's not easy to see light being bent by the forces of gravity or the orbit of a planet being affected by gravity. <clears throat> Mr. Solomon presents a pretty simple argument against karma. He uses the example of a former mob boss, Carlo Gambino. Carlo Gambino was a really, really bad guy who did a lot of really, really bad things. And apparently nothing ever really, really bad ever happened to Carlo Gambino and he died <coughs> in peace at his home at the ripe old age of 75. Therefore, karma cannot possibly exist. Right? Wrong. Honestly, I don't know anything about Mr. Gambino or his life, but it's really not relevant to this discussion. I'll accept the facts as presented by Mr. Solomon, although I'm sure Mr. Gambino's life was fraught with suffering like the rest of us. And who amongst, amongst us thinks that a life of murder and stealing would be enjoyable murdering your friends uh you know people you can't trust anybody is that really that i'm supposed to think that was a great life um <clears throat> but the problem it's not about gambino it's the problem with mr solomon's argument is that he doesn't understand the concept he's trying to debunk karma is one of those words we don't translate we simply transported the sanskrit word directly into our vocabulary that should be a tip to you, that this is not a simple concept. The word, as Mr. Solomon points out, simply means action in Sanskrit. This is true. But the Buddha's teachings on action inform our understanding of this concept. And without that context, you'll never understand karma. Mr. Solomon presents a rather uninformed and essentially fatalistic concept of karma. We've all heard someone at some point say, Oh, it's just my karma when something bad happens to them. But the early Buddhist concept of karma wasn't fatalistic at all. For early Buddhist, <coughs> karma was nonlinear and complex. The Buddha taught <coughs> excuse me. The Buddha taught that karma acts in multiple feedback loops, with the present moment being shaped both by the past and present actions. Present actions shape not only the future, but also the present. Also, present actions need not be determined by past actions. In other words, there is free will, although its range is somewhat dictated by the past. The nature of this freedom is symbolized in an image used by early Buddhists, flowing water. Sometimes the flow from the past is so strong that little can be done except to stand fast. At other times, the flow is so gentle that it can be averted in almost any direction. But Mr. Solomon's argument also fails in another important aspect. He fails to realize that our concept of self is not empirical at all. What we are is a nebulous concept at best, and insidious at worst. This goes back to the Buddhist doctrine of anatta, or the not-self strategy, which is really the key to understanding karma. 
In his effort to master karma in such a way as to bring karma to an end, the Buddha discovered that he had to abandon the context of personal narrative and cosmology in which the issue karma first presented itself. Both these forms of understanding deal in categories of being and non-being, self and others. But the Buddha found that it was impossible to bring karma to an end if one thought in such terms. For example, narrative and cosmological modes of thinking would lead one to ask whether the agent who performed an act of karma was the same as the person experiencing the result. Someone else, both, or neither. If one answered that it was the same person, then the person experiencing the result would have to identify not only with the actor, but also with the mode of action, <coughs> and thus would not be able to gain release from it. If one answered that it was another person, both oneself and another, or neither, then the person experiencing the result would see no need to heighten the skill of understanding of his or her own karma in the present. In either case, the development of the fourth type of karma would be abandoned. Mr. Solomon has attempted to debunk something he really doesn't understand. The Buddha's doctrine of karma takes the fact of skillful action, which can be observed on the ordinary sensory level, and gives it an importance that for a person pursuing the Buddhist goal must be accepted on faith. Skillful action is the primary factor of our happiness, which ultimately leads to our awakening. These assertions cannot be proven prior to an experience of that awakening, but they must be accepted as a working hypothesis in the effort to develop the skillfulness needed for awakening. Once we understand that karma is a nonlinear, complex process that transcends our personal narrative cosmology, it becomes clear that it's really not so easy to debunk with a simple tale of good things happening to a bad guy. If Mr. Solomon is the scientist he claims to be, then he must recognize that in order to disprove something, he must be willing to at least carry out the experiment to see whether or not there is any validity to it. In this case, the laboratory is our mind, and the Buddha has done a good job of explaining how to carry out this experiment. Karma may or may not be true, but we do not choose to believe it. For Buddhists, it is merely a working hypothesis that informs our practice. Thank you.